Thank you for joining us again for another interesting edition of The Woman in You. I've got pride, I've got potentials, and I have class of special. Joan Uche is my name, welcoming you to another interesting edition of The Woman in You. As you know, on this program, we come to showcase the worth of every woman. Why? Because every woman is wonderful, every woman is outstanding. Every woman is marvelous, adorable, and nice, and we should be treated that way, always. But unfortunately, a lot of our women have lost confidence in themselves. And we come to tell you, sister, you are 100% that queen. Believe in yourself. And we come in today with one wonderful woman, yes. Uh, you must have met her somehow, some way. Uh, she's uh, very outspoken. She is an amazing woman you like to want to meet one-on-one. -on -one. Ladies and gentlemen, join me to welcome the Chief Executive Officer, Koyenu Imala Foundation, and Chief Executive Officer, Center for Transparency Advocacy, Abuja, Faith Umadishi. Thank you for joining us today on The Woman in You. Thank you so much for having me. Good day, viewers. Okay. Well, we're wanting to have you here because we know that uh, you're one woman that people really want to see, listen to. And you have been wondering, uh, how, do, how does she do it? How, you know, a lot about her, plenty how, plenty how, plenty how. And today we have you here. So let's first and foremost uh, find out who is Faith Mwadishi. Thank you so much um, for having me. Faith Mwadishi is from Chicago Makotas in Amai. In the Kwani local government area. I was born to Mr. and Mrs. Michael Mwadishi of blessed memory. I grew up um, as a child in my, with my parents. Growing um, up, I was actually born at Abu. And then, by the story has it that uh, when I was born, my father was not around because he was uh, still searching for a job. So he had to travel to Lagos. So he was not there when I was born. And for three months before he came back, I didn't cry, I didn't open my eyes. But the night he came, uh, my mother had to take me to her village, her maternal village at Dumujuno. So, but the night my father came, it was the night the entire village believed that I was not born the phantom because they heard my voice. And the next morning they saw my eyes. I, I was I opened my eyes. You're indeed a wonderful child. <laughs> <laughs> and that uh, kind of uh, bonded my father and I to uh, together. But also uh, after that we moved to Lagos. Uh, my other younger ones were born in Lagos. Uh, my parents were not very rich. As young as I was then, my mother would make uh, puff puff, and I would go to sell. At that, uh, at that very young age, I would go to sell and I will come back. I went to Araromi Primary School at uh, Jigule <laughs> in Lagos. And I left there. Um, my father got a job, but it was not very stable. So we had to move again back to his village this time in Okwane, where then I was in 
primary two when we left Lagos. But because I was big from childhood, and when we got there, I told them I was in primary four. They put me in primary four, but I couldn't cope. And you know those days, you have big people, very big people there in primary school. So when my, my parents came visiting, and they heard that I was in primary four, they asked them to take me back to, <laughs> they asked them to take me back to primary two. We eventually left um, there and went to Benin City. Okay. It was in Benin City, I, I started, I, I got to, of course I was still in primary two, final year. So by the time I finished my third term in the village, we were supposed to come to Benin and start primary three, but they didn't have space for me in primary three. So the choice was either to repeat primary two or just go to primary four, even when I fail, I would uh, continue. But fortunately, I got to primary four and first time I came seventh. Wow, out of how many? <laughs> I don't know about that. Some people in the class, I came seventh. You know, it was very funny. I, I, I the, the, that, the initial period, I couldn't really cope mm -hmm. because I couldn't even read the books. And then mm -hmm. I had a neighbor who was in primary three who should come to meet me to say, oh, please read it. And she would read it by herself and say, yes, 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 you are correct. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had a very uh, smooth um, childhood. I had parents who were loving who were very hardworking, but also wasn't so rosy. I wasn't born into a family, uh, into a very rich family. We, I, I grew up with parents that uh, understood and taught us to be able to do things. You know, like I, just, mm -hmm. I told you, I went selling, I did some uh, things, you know, hawking while in Lagos. So by the time we moved to Benin City, my father's uh, job had stopped. So he started a business on his own. The business started experiencing some hitches. We had to move back to my father's village in our mind. I went there, I go to primary school. I was I was a pupil there. My mother would make uh, moi moi and I would take to the market on market days uh, to sell. My younger brother is about five years younger than myself. So I grew up, you know, and because I already have, I came very big, you know, I had big bones. So I would go to the market to sell on market days and that was how they were supporting us, you know. Eventually, uh, things became so rough, we had to go back again to my mother's maternal village, Dumujuno, where my mother would go to Iseluku and carry uh, bags of uh, flour on credit, she will make uh, chin chin and all those. I will take you to the market. As soon as she finished selling that bag, she will go back and get like two. You know, so she, she, she had that credit facility, and that helped us uh, a lot. Until my father's uh, business of uh, stabilized and went uh, back to Benin. So it was in Benin. I finished my primary school at our primary school. I eventually went to uh, Saint Maragoreti. From St. Margaretty, I went to India College. I finished uh, from India College, and um, by the time I finished from India College, I, I moved. I got an admission into the Polytechnic Auchi at that time. The reason why I went to Auchi that, at that time because I also had at the same time an admission to University to do both names. but I, I I had an admission to do civil engineering, and we I had this early awareness that. Um, uh, it was only males that were allowed to do civil engineering. <laughs> so I just told my parents that no, I want to go to do uh, civil engineering. Yes, mm -hmm. and I, I got that admission to do civil engineering. My year one, my year two, they were very good. Uh, by year two, it was not very good because I lost focus. Um, in year two, I, I got, I had my first boyfriend, and so I was, I lost focus really. I know why I'm saying this is important because a lot of young people they go and they lose focus and yes. they don't, they're not able to retrace yes, their steps. steps. But I was lucky; I was able to retrace my steps. I was able to get back to my academics, and by the time I was graduating from HND, I became the first female to come up with a distinction. Wow. In the Department of Civil Engineering wow. in uh, Aoutchi Polytechnic. So I, I like to say that story a lot when I talk to people so that they don't feel that it has always been uh, mm -hmm. that rosy. I, uh, from from a, 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 a you know upper credit student, mm -hmm. I had 3.5 in my first year, but graduating from my ONG, I barely made a pass. I barely made a pass. So when I was going back, my father sat me down and said, if you come back with this type of results next time, I will disown you, I will do all of that. But I also wasn't really proud of that because 
considering that I was among the first five in the first year, mm. and then graduating my ONG, I was among the last five. Mm. It was that bad. And so I, I made it, uh, took it upon myself. I said, when I go back, I'm going to do better. better. And to the glory of God, I actually did better. I came up with a distinction, like I, I said, and uh, it's been said that in the history of the Alto Polytechnic in my department before me, I was the first female to come out with a, a distinction. Mm. So we came and we went on to um, uh, youth service. Uh, my father got married to another wife who became a polygamous so and you know the problems associated with polygamy. I did my youth service in Lagos. A lot of people would say, oh, okay, you're very lucky to uh, do your youth service in Lagos. But it wasn't really rosy because now you had that division in the home and now I was the first person to graduate. My younger ones were still at school. Remember I said the gap I have with my younger ones. Mm. I had to begin to look for a way to fend for myself. And one of the things I did uh, uh, when during my youth service was to go to a woman to learn how to make soap, make uh, pomade, and all of those things. In fact, I learned. I eventually started a small school where I was teaching people to um, how to, to make soap. how to make soap. But before then, when we were going for my um, graduation at school, I couldn't even raise the funds uh, to do that. People from church. I was a member of the charismatic then in Lagos. People from church, from the office. Luckily, I served with the NMPC, so they did a contribution for me to travel. I came back and I had some money. What I did, I went to Balogun Market. I bought ties and shirts. Because I was working in a corporate organization, I would take those ties and shirts and sell to people. Some of them would buy on credit, and, and then, but I was saving money. Mm -hmm. It was the money that I saved that eventually went to do, to learn how to make those soaps. I had um, a stamp for myself, I had all that. I would go to the market, then I would stay in Bariga. I would make a, a, pack, a carton of soap and I would take it to Bariga to, um, to sell. I was doing all of that until the Abiola crisis uh, started. Mm. I had to come back. Then, at the creation of the state, we came back to Delta, um, to Delta State. I came back as soon as I finished my UCL. There was no job. They were always promising here and there. I went to Kaduna for a job interview, but I didn't get I didn't get the job. I went to Chevron. I didn't get the job, especially the Chevron uh, job. It wasn't because I was not qualified, but because there was somebody, a man there, who wanted to stick with me, and because I refused, he didn't submit the application. Because as a youth couple with NMPC, you had access to those companies. So they were recruiting, and we sent, and he didn't um, submit my letter because I had to travel uh, back because of the Abiola crisis. By the time I came, they had uh, finished um, all of those uh, things. But it didn't uh, deter me, it didn't uh, stop me from going ahead. Unfortunately, as I was trying to struggle to get my feet, I lost my father. I lost my father in um, November 1995 and I just finished my youth service. I was just uh, about 24 years old uh, at, uh, yeah, 21 years old at that time when I, I lost my father and I had to take up the responsibility of caring for my family. Uh, I had to take up the responsibility of running his business. He had a publishing outfit in Benin. I moved back to Benin. I ran the business. We started having other arms of the business. Opened up um, a, it's, it's a publishing outfit. We now opened up a civil engineer. We had to re register, you know, to be able to um, get that. And it wasn't easy because I had younger ones who were just growing up. My younger brother got admission to the uh, University of Port Harcourt in October 1995, and my father died in November 1995, just one month uh, after. So it was in the process of doing all that. But while in school, I was a, I was a very vocal uh, student. I was a member of the student union, at, uh, union. and at a point, I, I contested election into the student uh, senate. I was the only woman I was uh, voting as the deputy registrar of the student senate and we started all of those activism from there right from uh, uh, right from school so it's it those things helped my formative years mm. helped me to continue and it, it also exposed me to lo a lot of injustices that happen mm. injustice uh, women who don't have voices because they are women and because of culture I was lucky to have a father who didn't believe that because
just a woman, you cannot excel. He gave everybody equal opportunity, and that helped me a lot. Uh, uh, from then, after I, I lost my father, I went back to Benin, started running his business. I eventually joined um, a, a group, it's a civil society group called Women in Nigeria. In, it, it, it was actually the foremost women group. A lot of activists that you see in Nigeria today got their teeth caught by being members of women in Nigeria. I, I became their do state coordinator. At a point, I was the youngest uh, coordinator of the women in Nigeria uh, group, and I grew from there. They were using my office. I grew to become the national secretary general of the group. We were confronting the military. We were everywhere. Uh, they, at the time, we had that uh, IBB Moscow uh, mm -hmm. crisis that we came. Uh, back. I was supposed to have been arrested, but my younger brother was arrested. In fact, his elbow was broken by the police, but we were, happy, we were lucky that he was eventually released. They didn't take him uh, to Abuja. So when my father died, issues around widowhood rights for my mother too. But because of the fact that from school I had that uh, orientation, I was able to fight off some family members who tried to take over my father's <laughs> business. <laughs> You know, uh, I was able to find that. I don't know where I got the courage from, but I guess because of my activism and the kind of things mm -hmm. I was doing, I was able to get them. There's a particular uncle of mine who came and shared the company, you know, the way. And I just called them and said, you know, before my father died, nothing like that, sure. But I just said to save the company. Mm -hmm. Before my father died, he already said both of us were going into business together. Mm -hmm. I've just finished. I have my uh, certificate in civil engineering. He wants to open a construction company. So... As it is now, I'm the managing director of this company, <laughs> you know. So, but we were able to do that and to, uh, to uh, God be the glory, I was able to hold on to that company. I, I ran that company until my brother came out from school and then he came to take over. And I, I want to tell you that um, my father died in 1995. I ran that company till about uh, 2006 or, or thereabouts. And since then till now, I've not taken a cover from that company. My younger ones are the ones running the company and they are running it and they are take, using it to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. But I have been able to set up a company, I called it Faithling Concepts. I, was, I continued to be doing all of those businesses. Mm -hmm. I went into printing, I would go to companies, I would take contracts, I would go print, I would do printing jobs and I would send them. So I was making some income uh, uh, for myself and I was able, through some of the incomes I was making, I was able to make some savings and that was how I first founded the Koyeni Mala Foundation. The reason for founding Koyeni Mala Foundation, uh, as the name is, is to show to the people that, one, you cannot give what you don't have. You need to be able to have some certain capacities, understand certain things before you can even give it out and showcase it. So we started using uh, the Koyeni Mala Foundation platform to reach out to uh, widows, children, people with disability, mm -hmm. and young people. All right, now let's get to lot of okay. uh, empowerment right. at that level. Yeah, we're going to get to talk more about <laughs> Koyen Malam Foundation yeah, later. Let's uh, still look in. As, as, uh, you're, a lot, of course, you've told us a lot yes. your formative years, and it's quite interesting anyway. But let's ask, what actually were your dreams as a young girl? What's actually, or oh, what do you want to, what do you, what do you dream to want to become in life in future as a young girl? So as a young girl, then we had the um, history about, oh, I want to become a doctor, I want to become a lawyer. But I always wanted to become a doctor, and I was reading the sciences, I wanted to become a doctor. And that was why, actually, I had that admission to do both me, which was like more of sciences. But for me, when I got the admission to do uh, civil engineering, it was like, okay, so maybe they say it's meant that, like, me too, let me go and try <laughs> and do it for myself. So which means right from time, you've always <laughs> wanted to let people know that what the man can do, the of woman can course, do as well. Yes, you really yes, believed in yes, yourself, I right? Believed, from I believed in I that because know. I had a principal, Mrs. Florence Asamota, she, mm -hmm. she, she really helped in also pushing me to become what I am today. I used to be a very shy person because I was always big. When I was in class five, I was born in 19. So I was really big. Mm -hmm. And so people will bully me, people will laugh at me. Eventually now I can go to a place and people are looking at me and I'm saying my weight is an advantage to me. I used to intimidate people like that. I, I can go into no matter the crowd that is there, I can go into there and people will understand that somebody just has come in there. Yes. Because I had a principal who said, No, you cannot continue like this. You need to 
you, you need to get out of that shell. You need to be able to speak and confidence about yourself. yourself. So that really helped me. And I, I joined the uh, press club in the school. I joined science club. I eventually became a member of the Catholic, uh, Young Catholic Students Association. And I started from there and it's, uh, I've not stopped since then. And you're, you're still going on and on. <laughs> That's nice. So you actually wanted to be... A in doctor, doctor before, yes. but um, somewhere you said, let's do what the men are doing. Exactly. <laughs> so today, as the Chief Executive Officer of Koyi Malam Foundation and of course, uh, uh, Centre for Transparency and Focus in Nigeria, are you being fulfilled doing what you're doing? Oh, a lot, a lot. I, I see that um, a lot of the injustices that I see happening, I have been in a position to address some of them. I may not have been able to address some of them. Not just at um, state level, I have been able to do that at national level, also at international level. And that has given me a lot of satisfaction. And at the time when I tell people, you know, I've paid my dues, I need to begin to uh, I have a lot of people are mentoring, I need to mentor more people um, so that we can continue this. At times I feel, oh, if I die tomorrow, or if I die today, all of this work we are doing, do we have people with the same zeal, mm -hmm. passion that we continue to do that? I would say yes, uh, that we have uh, all of those people. I thank God uh, that with the work I have done, I have been able to change a lot of things. I've been able to put smiles on a lot. There was a time in Delta State, I was supporting about a thousand orphans across Delta State. So, and that brought a lot of joy to me. There was a family we met in Edo State, uh, during some of the projects we are having, and this old woman was taking care of the granddaughter. And we gave her just 3,000, and she said, she started crying. She sells cola nuts. And she said, you know what, my daughter, it's not, like, it's not that I've not seen this money, but I have never held it together like this. Mm -hmm. I've never counted this money that you have given me together like this. She sells cola nuts, and she was able, able to do that. Another time, we went to a community, and we saw a woman that's blind, with five children blind. Abandoned by her husband in a do state, uh, Eastern Central Local Government area. So, but we were able to now get her to the hospital and they started taking uh, care of her. A lot, a lot uh, mm -hmm. other uh, things I can mention. So, when I see that and I think about all of that, I'm happy. Uh, I think fulfilled. that my father will be happy in his grave. Yes. My mother also will be happy. I lost my mother in uh, 2015 to say that this is what I have achieved. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't easy. When I started, especially when I started activism and set up my organization, I didn't get a lot of support from my family. Even though a lot of people said that this was something that you have been called for, this is what you're going for. My family said I was spending my money, I wasn't making savings, I was. Instead of uh, looking at how to make savings and help people, uh, help yourself and support your family, they felt that I was doing it for outsiders. But I want to say today that because of what I have done, and I, I have been able to stabilize my family, I've been able to uh, put smiles on the faces of people I come across. I've been able also to meet people at very high level, mm. people ordinarily that maybe I wouldn't have been able to uh, meet and sit down mm. with. But because of the work that I do, it has given me access. Mm. A lot of access to some of these things uh, mm. that ordinarily you would just sit down and be thinking about. And it. that's putting a lot of smiles on your Of face. course, that's and giving me a lot of fulfillment. Okay, yeah. that's nice. It's good to know now that you, you pursue your dream. You believe in yourself, even as a woman, you can achieve that dream that you're dreaming about. Now, we have Faith and why is she here? She's telling us more of her story of her life. Now, let's come to talk about women, uh, the issue of gender issues in a country in Nigeria. Now, uh, a lot of women are well educated these days, you know, and then there's the same women don't go to school. Mm. Women are very educated, we have plenty. Well educated, have read up to up to PhD levels as well, but our society does not give them the opportunity to emerge, so they could place in positions of authority and all of that. What would be your advice to women on how to come out and really be placed in authority? Yeah, uh, before I, I go on to the advice, I just want to say that because of the culture that we have, our culture does not uh, have a place for women, and a lot of women were. Uh, um, grew up in a family that believes that, you know, really like I was speaking to some other person the other day from the East and they say, you know, a woman cannot break polano. That even when women gather, with a women's meeting, mm. a women's meeting, they have to look for a man that will come and break that polano for them. Mm. 
it's that because culture says that so even if the child is a five-year-old child and is a boy the boy will come to break that color not that women will eat in their own women's meeting so when you grow up with that kind of mentality the the, the greatest ambition you want to have in life you just say oh let me just get married and it ends there at the time they used to define week to say the women education ends in the kitchen, kitchen. but we, we we changed that we said no the women's education does not end in the kitchen because we have now seen that women can excel even where men have not been able to excel we have seen a lot of women for instance okonjo while our own from that state she's the director at the wt the first African to be there and she's a woman you know so my advice to women is that God has created us mm. apart from our sexual and reproductive uh, uh, rights and other things that God has created us he gave us a head he gave, and our head is not mm. put where our reproductive organs are mm. our head is exactly where the man's head is and the woman is a unique creature Fine. the Bible says that the woman is a weaker sex but in creating the woman, God created the woman with a special material. He first of all put the man to, to sleep and got a refined mm. material from the man. It's like In my profession, what we do is every time you are testing a material, you want to make it better. Yes. So once you have tested this material, you tell you want to make it better. Mm. You take that same material, add something to it, it and make it better, better to come out. So God created the man, put the man to sleep and took the, the rib of the man and added something value, added mm. value, no value to, to that and made the woman. Mm. And I tell people that you cannot, you, you, uh, the woman is a helpmate, fine. The reason why the woman is a helpmate is because the woman is made of a stronger character. Mm. Now, if you have a defect in a, in a building and you want to repair that building, what you need to do is look at the material, the original material of that building. You take a material of stronger strength, tensile strength and all of that to support that particular building. Why you have to do that is because you want to support this particular building to stand. If you take a material, let's assume you are a building with bricks and blocks, and then you want to repair it, you go and take mud to repair it. The bricks will fall down and destroy the mud now. But if you bring uh, some a ref, uh, a reinforced material to put in that place, it will stand. And that's the role of a woman. So. Once you are a, a support to a man, it's because you have a stronger uh, a strength. Emotionally, the woman is stronger. The woman can multitask. You see a woman, she's cooking in the kitchen. She can be reading. She can be uh, taking, taking care of her children. And she will come out, you know, with the food and everything. But the man will not do that. Put the, if the man is in the kitchen and you distract him, the food will get burnt. So it, it, it takes... The ability that God has given women to do that. And so we shouldn't take that for granted. That in any situation we find ourselves as a woman, always find a way out of that situation because God has given you that innate ability uh, to be able to do that. It's not easy to birth a child. The strength to birth a child. You know, there, there was a research that was done very recently. They brought uh, men and they had a machine that they put on their uh, stomach just to induce the pain, the measurable pain, not pain of tight beds, measurable pain that women, and a lot of them couldn't even stand it. They couldn't stand it because of that pain. Now talk less of if you bring that same thing and induce the pain of tight beds, they will die. <laughs> so women, we are made of uh, superior material. You are made strong. You are made. You are the helper. You are the helpmate. It is okay to cry. It is okay to be the woman that you are. But you can be better than what you are right now if you put your mind to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, haven't gone to school. Haven't read that. I was say, okay. I've I've done my first degree. I want to go back to do my masters. Okay. I will do a PhD as well because I, I want to. I want to get to this position. So what? How can they do it? If that, I just want to also say that um, I, I, I recently just concluded a PhD in Peace and Conflict and also started a Master's in Peace and Conflict. Mm, congrats. I want to uh, become a Peace and Conflict expert. Mm -hmm. you know, I do a lot around in the extractive mm -hmm. industries yeah. and then considering my background in engineering. I've done a few courses on health, so we will not talk about health, reproductive mm -hmm. health, sexual reproductive health, mm -hmm. we we'll want to talk about HIV and AIDS. I can actually give a lecture and wow, uh, do nice. all of that. So That's very important. 
asking why they are doing this and this and exactly. that. Exactly. So it depends on how you put your mind okay. to it. And luckily, there are a lot of institutions that do online training yes. now, and you can and you can manage that with your own time. Mm. They you look at it and say, this if I'm going to do a two year course and it's going to be too stressful, you can actually extend it to a three year yeah. course and you're able to do that. It is important that women get this uh, capacity, get this knowledge. Mm. One is that you have your local intelligence. Another thing is when you add uh, education to that, it keeps you, gives you an edge over the person who doesn't have an education. And when, and as a woman, when the way you have been created, you add education to that. You see, you have a, a broader view to issues. You are able to make money because when you go into business, you want yes, you, you, are, you are able to make money, and also you are able to manage people. So whatever sector you find yourself, you need to be able to. And that's why it's important. We are saying women should come into politics. One, women are, you know, um, originally made as managers. And that brings me to first and cause into yes. you right now because a lot of women don't believe in politics. We know the 2023 elections are around the corner right now and we've been crying break the bias. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was just discussing with you before I came on camera that so a few days ago uh, the high court in Nigeria has asked federal government to implement 35% affirmative action for women. But how can we do it if we don't believe in politics? A lot of women say politics is dirty. They say it's a dirty game. So how can you now, with the position where you are and the things you've been doing, what, what will be your advice to women and how can we change that mindset of politics being dirty and that's why women can't really want to get themselves involved in it? Yeah, when something is dirty, you need clean people to come in and clean it up. And my advice is that we need more women to come in and clean it up. If you look at the constitution of most political parties, they just give men mention to women and issues of gender. You need to have women who are card carrying members of that political party supporting themselves. You know, in the past you have a woman leader. They say it's the women's leader. Mm -hmm. But now you, uh, uh, Josephine Aleni, when she was made the woman leader for the PDP, she redefined that role to say that this person, this woman, mm -hmm. is not a leader of women, but is a leader in the political party. So that the, the respect you are called, the respect and privilege you are called to the male mm -hmm. leaders, you also are called to the uh, female leader. Having gone past there, we need to have more women who are card carrying members. We need to have women protect their, themselves, and we need to have the leadership of political parties understand that women can play an active role. That's why I'm very happy with that uh, uh, court ruling. I hope mm -hmm. that it will translate to what the National Assembly will do, ensuring that the five bills that women, for instance, you know, I, I, I don't understand it. I, as a woman, if I marry a foreigner, my foreigner husband cannot become a Nigerian, yeah, yeah. but my younger brother uh, can marry a foreigner and immediately the person becomes uh, a Nigerian. That is even lighter to compare to when I'm from Delta State, I may, maybe I marry somebody from Imo State, and I'm there, I've given birth to all my children, and still they say I'm not an indigenous of Imo State. And so I cannot get political appointments. I cannot run for an election because I'm not an indigenous. Where, of, your, uh, where your husband is. Your, ch your husband is there, your children are there, you have contributed everything about your life to that place. And then you cannot uh, be appointed or given a uh, uh, run for an election. In, in that, These are all the some of the things that uh, uh, hinder women. But we need to keep fighting it. We need to keep fighting it so that women who have made it Another thing that we need to also do is women who have been elected should mentor other women, should open the door for more women to enter. You don't lock it after you have passed. Because once you are elected into a position and you don't do well, the party will say, oh, we have given this opportunity to this woman. Even though they give opportunities to men every time and they, and they don't, uh, they don't do very well, they don't do very well but they still give opportunity. But when they give you opportunity as a woman, considering the challenges mm -hmm. and issues that we are having, you strive to excel, so that once you excel, well, they have given opportunity to one woman who can have uh, the other opportunity. And then, the, for me, the, the women in, in politics, who are politicians, you don't wait until it is 2022 to begin to make plans for 2023 election. Those people who are running election in 2023 started, started way back from 2011. 
So, and that's what we do. We wait, and some people feel that, oh, you need to be giving it. You have to fight for it. Mm. You have to make contributions to the political party. You need to be part of the process. They understand what you are doing. Nobody will call you from home and say, come and take this, if you have not been part of a process. Mm. So we need more women to be card carry members of mm. uh, political parties. Those who can do it, those who can sustain it, should come out, and then more women will support themselves. Women need to go beyond just buying a shwebi mm. for a uh, political rally. Yeah. When, they, when they begin to believe that politics is not dirty, they will come. Out. Yeah, no, That's but the, but even even when people say that politics is dirty, the whole le- electionary process, the value chain of elections, women are always there. It is when they come out and vote. For yes, them. they come out and vote. Even that the voting is actually the last part of it. When you go for rallies, it is women that you see there. When you they are the ones who wear the uniforms, look very colorful, just paint up the place. The day women say, if you don't give us a ticket, we will not go for your political rallies, things will begin to change. Okay. Things think, will begin to I change. I think we can start from there. Yes, we can start from there. Yeah. Now, a political party wants to hold a rally, and you say, oh, give the women money, let them go and buy food, and you buy wrappers for them, and say, come and wear and go. You come there, at the end of the day, they give the women like 1,000 1, naira. If those women don't come out there, that political rally will fail. They don't say, okay, what do you want? Give us two slots. Let it be women that will be part of it. And things will begin to change. They will begin mm. to have a conversation. That's beautiful. Yes, yeah, I think we're going to start from there now. Even as 2023 elections are very drawing very close. Yes, I think we'll begin to we'll start from there. Let's begin to have these conversations and begin to take decisions so, consigning what we want. Because like they say, if you don't come out, nobody's going to come to, to your house to drag you out. And if you don't speak out, this is what you want. Nobody's going to give it to you. So this is it's time we women will begin to speak out. And because we want a voice, we need to get involved. Yes, we talk of inclusivity there. Uh, we need to come out to be inclusive. Yes, Let's go on to talk about women and career. Some pursue politics as their career. Some education-wise, and some other things, maybe bankers building on that as a career. How you advise women to be able to build career, hold on to it, to really pursue it, to achieve their dreams, and as well, hold on their family because we keep talking about family as well. Because there's no way you can do without the family because, like they tell you, it's the woman that takes care of the home. Mm-hmm. Yes, traditionally in African setting, they tell you it's the woman that takes care of the home. So the woman must sit at home. That's where it started from. Women sitting at home and becoming housewives and all of that before now we begin to get awareness and begin to realize that you need to do something for yourself. Like a, a, a mother told me one time, as a woman, you need to have money of your own so we start working now but somewhere along the line you see women say oh uh, I, I can't so uh, I had to drop out from school or something like that or I had to resign from work because I need to you know take care of my family uh, take care of the home front so what would be your advice to women on how to hold on to a career pursue it and keep your home front together uh, the advice I will, I will give is that uh, women should find a balance Women um, should find a balance between career and home. And in finding that balance between career and home, you need to also take a conscious uh, decision because it will take a toll out of you. Is it that you want to decide to be a full time housewife or you want to be a housewife and at the same time a career woman? Because you want to put food on your table, you want to be able to hold your own, you want to, your children to grow up and understand that because you are a woman doesn't mean that somebody has to pay all of your bills. In fact, these days, um, yesterday, we were, I was out with some colleagues and then we they came out, they brought the drinks and the food and I said, um, okay, the next round I'm going to pay. You know, and they're like, oh, well, how many women want to do that? I said, well, there are so many women that are like me who can actually take friends out and pick the bill, you know, to pay for people. But some people also have that mentality that because I'm a woman, the man must always pay. That way, what you are doing is that you are belittling yourself. Mm. You're also selling out your best right. If you cannot hold your own even if nobody is saying come and bring up all of the millions but at least have something that will give you respect within your home it, it's, it's it's not always about oh I can cook the best meals I can sweep the house but once you are able to make one naira and you call this one your own there is this kind of pride that comes and now 
if you look at if you take a statistics around, I'm telling you, a lot of women are becoming the breadwinners of their home. If they didn't acquire the skill to be able to do that, they wouldn't have been able to um, do that. I know there's a lot of tension, but we need to find a balance so that even when you have that, there has to be a respect that is reciprocal. Mm. You know, um, what I don't agree with is in, at times when the man is the one actually picking the bills and he's talking down on the woman, society sees it as something normal. And then if once you change the wheel and the woman Man uh, picks the bill and talks back to the man exactly the way he has been talking to her. Oh, they say this woman, your money don't they enter your head and all of that. So, very important that we should begin to teach our girl child the importance of having an income. And to be able to have an income, you need to have a skill because you cannot stay at home and somebody uh, will just come to give you money. Is it that you have uh, some vocational skills or you're building a career, you have gone to school? And of course, politics is a career too. People make careers at, uh, out, of, uh, out of politics, but you need to be consistent in what you are doing. You don't go in today and come out because somebody has talked to you. Mm -hmm. You need to also be able to grow a thick skin mm -hmm. to be able to find that balance at home and uh, uh, in, uh, in your career. Because it is it's not until you find that balance you will see that one we upgrade the other is it that, that you're so engrossed in your work and your home suffers or you are so engrossed in your home and you are not able to deliver your productivity will mm. suffer in your uh, in it's your so career good. so it's important that we find a balance but it's most important that women should find a way to earn something for themselves there's a lady I buy a car from in Abuja she has a masters wow. yes she has a master's and every year she celebrates she celebrates that her Akara business. The last time she gave me a bottle of wine. Wow. She has masters. And then there was a young man who came there. One day I went to buy a car from her. A young man came there and you know was trying to talk that he said, We were classmates. I did I did this, we were classmates, we did the same masters. Is it because you are from certain part of the country and I'm from other part of the country? I'm not able to get a job. That's why you come to talk to me here. Were you better than me in class? Wow. 